Uh, but I want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, again, my name is Ram Gonzalez. Uh, I'm the chair of Meyer Van SA, which is a Friends of Downtown Commission. We help uh, kind of gather information from the public, the, the, the downtown supporting public, and kind of share that uh, to our policymakers and give them some of the feedback based on proposed policies and initiatives. Uh, this is our first core talk of 2019. Uh, obviously, housing is a popular subject. Uh, so thank you all so much for being here. Uh, we have, um, of course, the, the pleasure of being here at Freetail Brewery, so I want to thank them for opening their doors to us. Uh, please go ahead and take advantage of the, the beers and go ahead and get yourself comfortable. Uh, we have uh, our speakers, Jim Bailey. Uh, Laura Houston is going to be joining us in just a second here. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit uh, kind of about uh, what my going to say is about, what, uh, what we focus on and uh, kind of what the format of the discussion is like uh, for, for today. So we are focused on trying to make downtown a more vibrant, walkable, walkable downtown. Uh, we do that by engaging with the public, understanding, you know, bringing back that feedback to the policymakers and providing comments and feedback where we can. Uh, I'll ask the speakers to come and join me up here, if you don't mind. Jim, Lori, where are you? Um, so, uh, so the commission is actually made of uh, ten members, and uh, I don't know where you all are, but commissioners, raise your hand. There you go. So all these are all great people. Go ahead and give them a hand. They're helping out with the event, getting it all together for us. Thank God. So. We, these are all great people who get together, talk about downtown issues, and then share them with our policymakers to try to bring about a greater downtown. Um, and so I want to thank uh, Lori Houston uh, and Jim Bailey. I lost him. Uh, but tonight's discussion is going to focus on the future of downtown housing. And there's been a lot of discussion uh, of late in the past year and a half about downtown housing, about housing in general. Um, and so what we want to focus on tonight is really... Uh, not just housing for the sake of housing, but housing as, an, as a tool for downtown revitalization. And the city and, the de and downtown has been on a path for some time uh, to create the kind of downtown that we all want to see. And so uh, Lori Houston and many of the city leaders have been working very hard to uh, produce that kind of downtown that makes us economically competitive. And so uh, we wanted to kind of have this talk to really focus on, on that on housing as a tool for downtown revitalization. Um, and of course, you can't talk about housing, you can't talk about downtown without talking about, you know, uh, the, other, the other impact of that, both to downtown neighborhoods and, and housing in general. Uh, so we're honored to have Jim Bailey here with us. Um, Jim is an uh, architect with Alamo Architects. He's also most recently uh, served with the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force. I'll give him the opportunity to kind of describe that in a little bit. Uh, Lori Houston is uh, the assistant city manager with the city of San Antonio. Uh, she's also, uh, with some of the departments that she oversees, uh, all in one way or another touch downtown and impact downtown. So we're honored to have both of them here today. Um, and so uh, I want to uh, real quick just kind of describe uh, the way the discussion will happen this evening. You know, I kind of have my own questions that we'll kind of get into. Uh, we'll then at some, then uh, where are my commissioners again? Okay. So the commissioners have uh, index cards. If you have a question you already know you, you kind of want to see answered, uh, just raise your hand. One of the commissioners will come around and give you an index card, uh, fill it out, give it back to one of them, and they're going to kind of take them back there and kind of distill them into some top questions that we can be addressing. Um, and if there's time at the back, uh, at the end, we'll also be just taking general audience questions as well. So um, other thing is acronyms. So if you've de dealt with the government, uh, with the municipal leadership at all or any of these programs, you know, there's a lot of acronyms here. So if uh, you s if we mention one that we don't just define or describe, please just you know give me a blinking light or something like that, and then we'll we'll discuss it. I thought about making it a drinking game, but you'd all be drunk in ten minutes, so we'll, we won't do that. Thank you. So uh, so we're just going to go ahead and uh, dive right in this. So, Lori, we talk a lot about uh, downtown. Uh, housing and its impact in and around the neighborhoods. Um, and specifically, though, I kind of want to take it back to you know, 2009, 2010, when we really started looking at 
what kind of downtime do you want to see? Um, we did a downtime strategic framework plan back then. Um, and uh, we, the, the, the feedback that I remember getting is, you know, we want a downtown that we, the residents can enjoy, not just that it's a tourist spot necessarily. And so how can, how is, how is, let me back up. Let me say, why is downtown important? Why is downtown important, not just for the folks that live downtown, but just for the city as a whole? Why does it matter to make such a strong and successful downtown? Good evening, and thank you so much for including me in this panel. Um, you know, it's a great question, and I really like to say that downtown is, represents the heart of any community. So every great city has a great downtown. So when you go to a Final Four, or you're watching something on TV, what do you see? They end up showing that skyline of that downtown, whether you're in New York or in Seattle or Chicago, and now San Antonio since we had the Final Four last year. But you really need a strong downtown um, because that represents prosperity. I mean, that's where most of the jobs are. That is where um, most of the arts and culture are in your community. Most of our museums are in the downtown and surrounding area. Um, we are very lucky um, because we have a very strong tourist industry. And for the longest time, our downtown has been dominated by hotels and tourism. And that's wonderful. I mean, other cities would die to have that problem. Um, what we found out, though, when we did the downtown framework plan that Ramiro referenced in 2012, was that you know we need to focus on how we grow that tourism base, but also how can we grow that residential base? Because if you continue to have more tourists in your downtown, you're going to only have those types of tourist retail that you see. So if you go downtown, you can buy a coffee mug with the Casa Rio umbrellas on it, um, or you can buy a coonskin cap. Um, but you can't buy a pair of shoes or you can't buy diapers um, unless you go to the Walgreens. And so how do you change that retail mix? That's through providing residents, including residents in your downtown. And so, you know, we talked about, you know, what was our vision? It was about creating a downtown for tourists, for employees, and for residents. And we were missing that resident point, and that's why we started with that housing first strategy. Um, but, you know, the reason why you need an important downtown is because it represents prosperity. It also is downtown, that's where you have the most tax base, but you don't have as many services that are needed. And so your downtown ends up contributing to the overall city. And so for the tax dollars that all the commercial real estate buildings are downtown paying, that's also helped paying for the trash and street maintenance going on outside your downtown. Yeah, so I'll jump in. Uh, thanks for having me. So uh, the strategic framework plan that uh, they both mentioned, um, my firm worked with HRNA to develop. Um, after having observed the sort of downtown neighborhoods and downtown itself and, and the deadness that they've talked about and the sort of tourism uh, focus, we knew it was time to do something. So we had all these historic neighborhoods, all these streetcar suburbs that are around downtown and part of that downtown ecosystem, the two are interlinked. Uh, excuse me guys, whoever let these guys back here, make sure that doesn't happen again. That's very dangerous back there. There's a lot of things that people can hurt themselves on. So be you hear that? Back here, guys. Nobody in the back. Thank you. Um, where was I? Uh, so... How do we do that? Put it, put it closer to you. Yeah. There you go. So the, the neighborhoods around downtown have experienced uh, disinvestment since white flight in the 1950s. And we all who had grown up around downtown and lived in these neighborhoods saw this. And, and so all the neighborhoods at the time, I think, were sort of on board with this idea that we need more investment, not just in downtown, but in the neighborhoods around downtown. And so merrily we went off on our way to do it and so in in trying to accomplish this kind of vision for downtown you, you already mentioned it is we adopted this housing first strategy so so why housing why do we take that as strategy opposed to you know other other alternatives and i do want to stress that it's housing first but that doesn't mean housing only but we wanted to prioritize housing because if you bring in housing in your downtown you're bringing in that 24-7 resident. 
they are going to bring disposable income. That disposable income is going to help tip that retail market from touristy to more neighborhood serving. You change that neighborhood in your downtown and provide more services that support a neighborhood. Then you've created a space where employers want to go because their employees want to live there. And so we're seeing that quite a bit um, in our downtown area. I'm going to point to Pearl. Pearl, we focused on you know, affordable, I'm sorry, we focused on the market rate housing there. The market rate housing helped provide um, disposable income. We have a lot of restaurants there, but now we have the medical clinic that opened on the corner of Josephine Street and Broadway. You have a CVS going in there in the bottom of the Mosaic Apartments. So we're tipping that retail market to help support that neighborhood. Um, now we need to focus on a different type of product, which is what we did in the C-CHIP, focusing in that area to make sure that we're incorporating affordable housing because we do feel that we have a lot of market rate housing in that area. You're also seeing that pattern of development in the South Town. So the thought behind, um, the, thought behind the housing first is to saturate your area with housing, which brings disposable income, which brings more retail, which helps bring the employees who want to live in your area and employers want to locate where their employees want to be. So, and I'm going to hand it right back to you. Uh, so, a, a housing, a strong housing submarket downtown means a stronger downtown, ultimately. Um, now, so, you know, I'm an investor myself, so whenever I look at an opportunity, I'm, I ask, why is this opportunity here? Why has nobody else done this already? So when we look at downtown and we see that housing has not occurred in the past 20 or 30 years on any real meaningful scale to produce this kind of downtown, the question is, well, why? Why has it not already happened uh, up to this point or up to the point we passed uh, C-CHIP? But what were, you know, why? why? Why not until now? Why not until then? Uh, well, I think there are a number of factors at play. You know, for, first and foremost, we saw uh, an abandonment of downtowns across the country in every major city in the country. We've, over the course of the last 10 to 20 years, seen a, a, a resurgence of, of interest in living in traditional neighborhood patterns um, with access to good and services um, through multimodal transportation options, by walking, you know, by taking the bus. Um, and an interest in, you know, not having a, a long commute. I think that that has been, um, you know, ex exacerbated in San Antonio, in a sense, by, um, I think, sort of the marketing that we've done about our neighborhoods. And again, I will say that we all were complicit, neighborhoods and, and, and city government alike, in trying to make this happen. Um, I think that, um, you know, we're on the cusp right now in San Antonio of, of you know, real, real change. We're starting to see, as, as Lori will probably tell you, the reason for kind of continuing on with, with the C-CHIP policy in whatever form it takes or the fee waiver program is that, you know, we're seeing the, the tip of the iceberg in this sort of urbanization that most other major metropolitan areas are, are seeing. So I think now is a great time to have this conversation. I also think when you're talking about the downtown core, it has to do with land values. So our land values in downtown are all priced for a hotel project. Because hotels, they can turn every day. Um, our hotel market has 70% occupancy throughout the year. Um, limited service hotels, if you're to build a limited service hotel and buy some dirt, you're going to be able to get a return. Um, so that's why we needed to subsidize market rate housing in the downtown. Because if we didn't, it would continue to be more hotels. Um, another reason why we had the, the opportunity really is because the River Improvements Project. We, when we extended the museum reach north, just that 1.2 miles went from Lexington to Josephine Street, and we created a major improvement that was along all this vacant property. And people started looking at San Antonio differently. You had a beautiful river that people could live on, and that's when property started turning. As soon as you put a shovel on the ground, and we announced that the river project was funded, property started turning hands and housing projects started working. And right at that point, land values were a little bit lower, but you couldn't get the rents that you needed to support those. 
Now we've increased the land values because we've done so many improvements in our downtown and we're getting some rents, um, but they're not enough to support the projects and that's what we need to continue to subsidize. But if you're to ask me, you know, what changed? Um, it really was, we started believing in ourselves. We invested, we put money in the river. In 2007, there was $10 million in the bond program for downtown. 2012, after the SA 2020 effort, where the community came together and said downtown's a priority, there was $93 million in the bond program for downtown. Fast forward 2017, there's $165 million in downtown. Um, so we've, we've made tons of improvements. We started to believe in our downtown. And we still are priced for a hotel market. Um, and so until we get the rents to catch up to that, um, we're most likely going to continue to have to subsidize housing, whether it's market rate or affordable. Um, but we finally understand that you know downtown is a place for residents. It's not just for tourists. We have 14,000 hotel rooms in downtown San Antonio. And if you're to ask me, you know, when is enough, it's going to be when we get 14,000 residential units in downtown and we have that one-to-one -one ratio. So, real quick, um, so talk about, talk about C-CHIP, if you'll repeat the question. Yes. Describe what C-CHIP is and the housing, uh, housing assistance program that we have in downtown. So in 2012, when we adopted the downtown framework plan and we adopted that housing first strategy, we looked at what needed to be done to help facilitate this housing? And it was, of course, incentives. But the biggest challenge is we couldn't put the incentive packages fast enough, but when we put them together, they all kind of looked the same. It was a tax rebate, the waiver of your city fees, the waiver of your SAWS fees. And we were able to do, just because of staff capacity, three to four times, three to four projects a year. Well, our consultant said, make that just an as of right package. You understand the market dynamics in your downtown and the areas surrounding it. And so go ahead and make it as a right where if you build two or more housing units, you automatically get this. Um, that minimizes the risk of a developer and it helps us diversify who's developing in San Antonio. Um, prior to 2010, it was a lot of um, local developers who we love. I mean, I, Silver Ventures is great. Area real estate is great. Um, but now, because of this as a right policy and minimizing this risk, we have different developers who are coming from Dallas, who are coming from um, Indiana, coming from New York. They're looking at San Antonio and they don't have to live here to understand um, how to maneuver through the politics to get incentives because they're immediately available. And so if you're gonna build a housing project in a specific area, and we have, today we have three levels of areas you can build. If you build in the downtown area, you would automatically get a 15-year tax rebate of 75% on the taxes you pay for that improvement. That other 25% that you're paying is going to go into a fund to help support affordable housing. You also will get a fee waiver on your city fees, um, and usually that's about 1% of your project cost. And then you'll get a SAWS fee waiver of up to a million dollars. Now, we've added something for just the downtown core projects. If you're building affordable housing in your project, for every affordable housing unit you've included in that project, you get a $10,000 infrastructure grant. Because we're learning that, you know, sometimes in downtown, um, you need to build sidewalks, you want to underground your utilities, or you need parking improvements. So we're providing a $10,000 grant that can go towards infrastructure, and that's capped at $500,000. And then it, it goes down when you're in level two, which is the area surrounding downtown, and then level three it decreases as well. But that's as of right. And just based on, you know, we used to do three to four a year. In our first year, we did 13. Um, since 2012, we've had 65 CHIP agreements, which is the Center City Housing Incentive Policy. So we're able to do about 12 to 15 a year versus the three to four that we were able to negotiate with that developer. Go. Yes, the question was, is that posted anywhere? And if you were to go to www.sanantonio.gov backslash CCDO backslash incentives and programs backslash CCHIP, you'll get there. Uh, but, um, and I just happened to know that because I wrote that down today, so I'm not, that's not my savant. Um, but 
I do think Ramira can probably provide that link to everybody as well. But it is online, and if you were just to Google CHIP San Antonio, you'd find it. Um, and so, so CHIP was, was passed to be able to kind of fill that gap, right? Because the downtown submarket didn't really make sense even for market rate housing. And so with CHIP in place, market rate housing can actually make sense downtown. So what has been the, the results of, of CHIP to date? What has been the success of it? Um, and um, you, you kind of mentioned in terms of a, uh, a number of units uh, that you'd like to see. What kind of boundary would you, would you say you'd like to see that in, in terms of, you know, geography of downtown? No, I, I have plenty. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so when we set the goal in 2012 when the CHIP policy was adopted, our goal was 7,500 housing units by 2020. And our downtown boundary is very large. It's larger than most cities, but we're looking at everything within the interstate. And then Pearl area near Eastside, which is Sunset, um, St. Paul Square, and then near Westside, UTSA. So it's kind of within the interstate in those three areas. Um, it's a 5.2 square mile area. Um, we have about 6,500 housing units that have come online that are under construction or in the planning stages. So we're, we will meet our goal by 2020 of 7,500. We had a stretch goal of 10,000. And keep in mind that we already had 3,300 units online when we set this goal. So if we were to get 10,000 by 2020, adding that 3,300, we're about in line with that one-to-one -one ratio we want to see. Most of the projects we have seen are in the Southtown area and the Pearl area, and it's primarily along the river, which shows that if you build infrastructure and, and you're able to create a neighborhood, um, the projects will follow. Um, and so you'll see a lot of the CHIP projects um, are along the Museum Reach, are along Broadway, are in the Southtown area, primarily along Blue Star, where the river was extended south as well. question uh, for everyone here if you guys could define what market rate means and what affordable means within the definition parameters that we're discussing here I don't know that everyone understands what that is because that's a little bit of and I'll, I'll give that to Jim here see if he can help us out with that a little bit yeah. but before I do that I want to ask you also to, to comment on um, so you know C-CHIP has been a, a great success and so and then there was a moratorium um, placed on it, and um, you know, you being on the mayor's housing policy task force, uh, can you speak to you know why that moratorium was placed, and also describe you know the housing policy task force and what what its its kind of charge is and what your role was on it. Um, sh that's a big question. So let's tackle the uh, the sort of pause on the as of right, and it was just a pause on the as of right component of the, the fee waiver programs, the incentive policy. Um, individual uh, projects could still uh, go get approval by council. So it, it was paused because there was a, and, and I'm, I'm hope, hopeful I can go into a little more depth into this a little bit later. It was paused because there was this growing concern that perhaps we were having an impact on the surrounding neighborhoods and housing affordability. There was um, a concern, you know, people would read the Rivard report and see the latest article about, you know, the latest really high-end uh, development that was, that was being, quote, funded by city dollars. Um, that's, you know, that, that's kind of not true in the sense that I think what Lori would tell you is that these, you know, this this is future revenue that wouldn't exist if we didn't incentivize these projects. Um, that that revenue only exists because the city participated in in this process. Um, however, I think the other issue, the underlying issue, is is much more serious, and um, I'm happy to see that that the revised CHIP policy or the the fee waiver policy, as it's called now, um, goes a long way toward addressing. Uh, some of those concerns. So let me answer your question about um, housing affordability. So um, in San Antonio, um, the, the sort of median income for a family of four, that means half, half the families make 
more and half the families make less is about, what is it, $55,000 these days, Lori, something like that. It's much higher for the San Antonio metro area. It's 63 or 64, but the metro area includes um, outliers like Bernie and New Braunfels and so forth. So when we're talking about housing policy and we're talking about affordability, we're obviously concerned about things that are closer to home, uh, making sure we have a clear picture of, of what that means. So when, when we define what's affordable, we generally have uh, we use this term AMI, right, Area Median Income. And uh, generally, people who make 30% of the Area Median Income or less, um, we consider that really, truly affordable housing. That's, that's sort of, we call that public housing. I mean, these, these are people that, that need a lot of help. Um, 30 to 60% AMI, that's... That's affordable housing, and, and just about everybody that lives around downtown San Antonio is sort of in the 30 to 80 percent range. Um, 80 to 120, we you know the term for that um, is kind of workforce housing. You know those are your um, you know starting firefighters and police officers, it's teachers and so on and so forth. Um, market rate housing. In San Antonio right now, I don't know what the latest numbers are, but you know the the the, the average home sale price is like what two hundred twenty thousand uh, dollars as of the last report, and average rents are or median rents are something like a buck ten or a buck fifteen a foot. Um, so when we're talking about market rate downtown, we're talking about sale prices much higher than that because that's what the market will support. We're talking about sale prices multiples of that, and we're talking rents, um, you know, generally north of $2 a square foot. If you're talking about the central business district or tier one, um, it, it goes down a little bit in tier two, which is sort of south town and, and around the Pearl. Um, but uh, where, what was the other part of it? All right, so um, there's also a, a, a cap on rents for the downtown projects of, of uh, 275 a foot. So when we're talking about market rate downtown, we're talking about some pretty expensive housing. Um, the other question was the mayor's housing policy task force. You know, what what was it? Um, how is it germane to this conversation? Um, it was a year long process. I look around the room. I see a number of people who participated in this process with us. It was a um, small task force, five member task force. Included me, Gene Dawson from Pape Dawson Engineers, uh, Lourdes Castro Ramirez, uh, former Deputy Undersecretary of HUD, uh, Maria Beriozabal, former City Council person, and Noah Garcia from Vantage Bank. We had free reign uh, to study the problem and decide what to do about it. So the first thing we did is we went and rounded up a bunch of citizens and had a bunch of meetings. We, you know, we asked people what they were experiencing in their neighborhoods, you know, what was, what was going on in their lives uh, as it relates to housing affordability. We also hired a bunch of consultants. We worked with uh, NALCAB, National Association of, of Latino Community Asset Builders. We worked with LISC San Antonio and um, an economic and, economic and planning systems out of Denver to do all of our data for us. So this was a very data-driven process, um, both, in, both in terms of hard numbers that we were digging out and in terms of the stories and anecdotes that we were, we were pulling out of the community. We formed a series of technical working groups to tackle various components of housing affordability, and we developed, in the end, a, a set of recommendations that Council just recently adopted as the San Antonio Housing Policy Framework. And it, consu and it consists of a series of a uh, couple of dozen action items, uh, short, medium, and long term. And it consists of, I think, um, in, 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 in my opinion, probably most importantly, sort of the framework for a 10-year funding plan for dealing with affordable housing. And that includes affordable housing downtown. Thank you. Um, so when CHIP was being uh, proposed, or renewed, rather, um, and uh, incidentally, if you, if you have questions, make sure you write them down in the index card so that our, our commissioners can go around and get them from you. That way we can include them here. Um, but when CCHIP came up for renewal, um, one of the comments you made was about this displacement study. Um, and um, you tell us a, a little bit about what that is and how you, what, what would be the expectations of that, uh, of that kind of study. And 
what would that study tell us? Okay, so I, I don't know the answer to that. That's why we need this the study, I think. So um, we learned a lot over the course of this last year um, through all of our research um, and just sort of paying attention to what's going on. We've seen property values around the downtown area and in the central business district increase. And in some neighborhoods, it's been substantial. Places like Dignity Hill, we've seen a thousand percent increase in property values in less than 10 years. Um, that That's good in some cases, but it can also have some unintended consequences. We've seen land values in places like Lavaca uh, go from $5 a square foot to $40 a square foot, from $20 a square foot on Broadway to $150 a square foot. So we're seeing some some pretty serious um, some pretty serious cost in, increases. Um, we've heard a lot of anecdotes from people who are saying they want to move back into the downtown area or they grew up in the neighborhood and they can't afford the rents. We we're hearing from people saying, I used to live downtown and I can't afford to live downtown anymore. And by downtown, I'm not just talking about the central business district. I'm talking about all the supporting neighborhoods, you know, including Southtown and, and, and the Pearl. Um, we're, we're hearing stories of people who, you know, can't tap the equity in their homes, you know, their newfound wealth. Um, you know, in these historic disinvest in historically disinvested areas of San Antonio, where their house is worth thirty thousand dollars and now it's worth three hundred thousand dollars, and you know they're on a fixed income, or you know they can't afford the debt service to go out and, and tap that newfound wealth. Um, property taxes are going through the roof, and we've got you know flippers prowling all the neighborhoods and paying fifty cents on the dollar for for some of these houses. So. I, I don't know what whether we have widespread issues or not. You know, we've got you know, displacement cases. There's the soap works. We've got mission trails, so on and so forth. I don't know what the extent of the issue is, but there's an awful lot of smoke here, right? And so what I'm hoping that this study will tell us is what has been the effect of, and I don't think it's necessarily these policies. I think that these policies are, are, Perhaps saying San Antonio is open for business, but this is a nationwide trend. It's happening everywhere in every city, whether there are incentives or not. But I, I'm hoping what this study will tell us is the extent of the problem. So we can analyze it and we can determine what we need to do um, in terms of kind of preventative measures. And we've outlined funding in the housing policy framework to, to, to deal with it. And I'll get into more solutions. Thank you. Um, and so, Lori, with all this in mind, CCHIP came back with some revisions, um, specifically to speak to some of these issues and concerns the neighborhood that the neighborhood brought up. And um, and so, there were. So, can you talk a little bit about what those some of those revisions were, and what do you see the outlook for in terms of housing downtown, kind of central business district, considering? I mean, I don't know if it's considered a reduction in incentives for that for that particular submarket. So when we were working on revising the CHIP, we knew that there was a need for affordable housing in downtown. So we looked at the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force report, looked at those recommendations, and tried to see where we can align the recommendations in the report into a new policy. And one of the things that the policy wanted was it wanted a dedicated revenue stream for affordable housing. We don't have that right now other than the home and CDBG funding that we have or the actual um, general fund dollars that sometimes get programmed um, annually. And so we did create a dedicated fund in the CHIP for any project that is getting these incentives for every time you pay your taxes on that project, the city will only rebate 75% of that tax payment back to you and the other 25% will go into a fund to support affordable housing. Now that fund is going to be dedicated to projects meeting the 60% AMI or below need. We know through the Housing Task Force report they did that the greatest need for housing is to meet that 30 to 60% AMI. And so what we're doing is we're dedicating that fund to that 30 to 60%. So those are all CHIP projects regardless of where you are. Now for the downtown area what we learned is you know the, the land prices are still too high and the market rates aren't there to be able to support those land prices. 
And so we did not require there be an affordable component in the central business district. However, we did provide you an increased incentive if you incorporated affordable housing in your project to try to provide that bonus. Now for the areas surrounding downtown, which are Pearl, Southtown, the near east side, near west side, we did a, a, a requirement of you must be above five stories, which is you must be a steel and concrete structure, or you must include 20% of affordability in your project, of which 10% has to be at the 80%, that workforce level, and 10% needs to be at that 60% AMI, which is what we're considering affordable housing. And so it was, you either go up, which your construction costs go up quite a bit when you go to steel and concrete, or you incorporate affordability. And that's how we addressed, you know, some of the affordability needs in the CHIP. Um, what we learned, though, is, you know, when you're trying to build affordable housing, in the downtown area, or actually just throughout the city, the C-CHIP alone is not going to be the tool that's going to get you there. The C-CHIP is going to be one of several tools that you need to layer on to make that project work. And so we wanted to make it very clear that we still need market rate housing in the central business district. We are lacking that. But we do want that affordability, and so we require that um, 10% at 16, 10% at 80 in the outside areas. But we are going to be working with all the developers to see how we can layer on more incentives and provide them access to other tools so they can increase that affordability. So a great example of that is the Museum Reach Townhomes. That is a project being done by Alamo Community Group. Um, they are building 95 housing units, of which 86 of them will be at or below 60% AMI. And that's the target that we want. And in fact, that is one of the first C-CHIP projects that we're doing as a result of this new policy. That project not only received C-CHIP, but it received housing tax credits from the state of Texas that provided an additional benefit. It's going back to that layering. Um, we have actually two other applications in right now um, that are providing, um, actually I think total with the Alamo Group Museum Reach project, we have about 500 units um, through the new C-CHIP project that are in process, and about 40% of those are going to be at 60% AMI or below. Um, and they are all layering the tools. So the C-CHIP is working, it's helping bring affordable housing, and then every one of these projects is contributing to a, a fund. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were aligning with the housing goals creating a dedicated revenue stream, and also helping facilitate more development downtown. Other things that we learned when we were going through this moratorium process is that there was a real concern about C-CHIP projects encroaching on neighborhoods and a developer purchasing a single family home or two or three, knocking them down and building a multifamily housing project. And so in our policy, if you were ever zoned single family within the past five years, or you have to rezone from single family to something else, you're not eligible for these incentives. And so you would not get these as of right incentives. It's to make sure that we're protecting those neighborhoods. And so, and that was something we heard loud and clear from the development community, and from the neighborhoods as well. The other issue we heard was design. A lot of projects were going into neighborhoods where it was zoned appropriately, and they didn't care about what the design looked like. And so every project that gets incentives from the city of San Antonio must go through the design review and must go through the HDRC process to really hold them to a higher level of design. Um, so we've made a lot of changes. We've aligned them with the housing task force report. We also listened to the neighborhoods to make sure that we were providing them the protections that they wanted. Um, so um, you know, I think, you know, folks might ask, what would happen if we just stopped incentivizing market rate housing downtown? I don't know the answer to that. I've done a lot of analysis working with Lori kind of through this. Um, you know, every development deal is different. Everyone has a different financing structure. And I think the answer is with the current sort of fee waiver policy, incentive policy, um, you know, some deals will happen 
Okay? Like if we didn't have it, some deals will happen, some will be marginal, and some won't happen. The same is the case with the policy in place, right? I mean, there's some that just that just aren't going to make the cut. Um, I think you know there are some things that I think are really successful about what what Lori has done with this with this latest policy, and one of one of which is around this notion of one of the things that was reaffirmed, reaffirmed during our housing policy task force work is that affordability is not just defined as spending no more than 30% of your income on housing. HUD defines it as housing plus transportation equals no more than 45% of your, your annual income, right? So San Antonians spend 21% of their income on transportation on average. It's because we're a commuter city, we're a car city. We don't have a robust functioning multimodal transportation system and we are sprawled out all over hither and yon, right? So, you know, one of the things that we hope for with, with, with downtown and not just downtown, and so let's, let's be clear, I mean, downtown doesn't drive the city. It's important, but it doesn't drive the city. We can't fit 2 million people downtown. We can't fit all the jobs for 2 million people downtown. But we have the SA Tomorrow Comprehensive Plan. And this, this is a robust roadmap that identifies 13 regional centers throughout San Antonio that we want to dense up. And it links them all with robust transportation corridors. This is all in alignment with the VIA 2040 plan, right? So the, the thing that we learned is that San Antonians, a lot of San Antonians can't afford a car, especially downtown and in these regional centers where the jobs are. You know, where we have legions of, of low-paid service workers, you know, people who are earning $20,000 a year, you know, $25,000 a year, $30,000 a year, um, they, they need to live close to where they work. A perfect example, you mentioned Alamo Community Group, is their Calcasieu building right downtown. I think it's 63 units, something like that. Of those, and, and, and it's affordable, it's, I think it's up to 60% AMI, I'm not sure. Um, but of those 63 um, units, the families that are that are living in there, I think at last count, it was somewhere between 10 and 12 total automobiles, right? That's because those people walk to work because they live close to where they work and they cannot afford a car, right? So this is why housing affordability downtown and in the regional centers and along our transportation corridors is absolutely critical. So I, I, su I support the sort of tier three, which was a later addition to um, the, the, the fee waiver policy, because what it says is once we go through the master planning process, the SA Tomorrow physical planning process for each of these regional centers and transportation corridors and so forth, those incentives will then apply uh, to those regional centers and, and transportation corridors. And, and I think that's important for a, a number of reasons. Um, we can't build all the housing downtown, but we need a lot more affordable housing downtown. We need a lot more affordable housing in medical center. We need a lot more affordable housing at, at airport, at Brooks, at Port San Antonio, and every, everywhere else where, where our, our jobs are. So I think that's a damn good piece of policy. And I wanted to add that. Thank you for bringing up. It was level three that went to all the regional centers. We. When we looked at the report, we saw there was a need of about 10,000 multifamily housing units, which the majority would be at that 60% AMI or below. They all can't fit downtown. And so where do we want them to go? We want them to go where the community said they needed to go for the SA Tomorrow Regional Center process, which is putting them in the areas near the medical center where there are jobs, at Brooks, at the Port. And so we feel very comfortable moving forward. I mean, the, the C-CHIP will help us layer on those tools to get, you know, at least a thousand of that 60% AMI in the downtown area, but they'll be spread out throughout those other 12 regional centers. So Lori, um, I guess my first thought when I saw this kind of expansion of the policy, which is great, um, but what about resources for this? You know, are we, are, we, are we just spreading the peanut butter too thin to be able to cover all of this and, you know, is there an anticipated increase, in, particularly like when we talk about like SAW's impact fee waivers, which tend to be a huge 
uh, hit on projects. Um, kind of what is the strategy there in trying to make sure that we have the appropriate amount of resources for this expanded plan? Now, when we changed it to all levels, the only tool that changed really for affordable housing is that tax rebate. Um, because if you're an affordable housing project, you would have already qualified for the city fee waivers under the city fee waiver program. And so it wasn't a new tool that was being made available to these other projects. So now um, the resource is actually the taxes that developer pays as a result of the improvement of the project. So as long as they're paying their taxes, we're going to rebate them that 75%. Now the city and SAWS fee waivers, those are allocated annually. Um, I think we get about two and a half million for the city fee waivers and about three million annually from SAWS. Um, the Center City Development Operations Department um, and our Housing and Neighborhood Services Department, we try to be creative when there are um, projects that maybe we don't have enough SAWS fee waivers, we'll work with the tourism unit to be able to compensate them for those fee waivers. Um, but right now, nothing has changed because through the prior fee waiver policy provided affordable housing projects access to those same tools, with the exception of the tax rebate. So we've gotten some questions that kind of follow the same theme, and I'm going to direct this to you, Jim. Um, but in terms of, and this this is a little bit beyond the scope of you know central business district district downtown and kind of what Meyer BNSA focuses on, but it's part and parcel to the discussion. You cannot have any kind of change without some kind of unintended consequence. So when you're talking about uh, all of this this progress, which is great, um, you know you can help but you know consider displacements as you've discussed. And so what are some of the conversations uh, that are happening in terms of different potential solutions and strategies to kind of at least mitigate uh, some of the, the, the impact? We don't want to stop progress, but we want to see what we can do to mitigate the unintended consequences, correct? Okay, so yeah, I mean, as, as you might imagine, um, through the housing policy framework discussion, this was, this was a major component of, of, of what we looked into. And it, it's a big, complicated uh, problem. We don't have any hard data on the magnitude of the problem yet. As I, as I said earlier, we need to do the study so that we understand the magnitude of the task at hand. You know, what, what we looked at uh, through the housing policy framework was sort of macro level solutions. Um, there, there are some policies that are underway right now. So I think first and foremost is a displacement mitigation. It's called displacement mitigation and prevention, but it's really a displacement mitigation policy that uh, the City of San Antonio Neighborhood and Housing Services Department is working on. There have been a series of public meetings um, over the course of the last few months to determine what this looks like. This is one of the, the key recommendations of, of our report. And what this is, is it's an emergency policy. It's for dealing with rapid rehousing, you know, counseling. It's for dealing with people who are being displaced because we failed to prevent that displacement in, in the first place. Um, and I, I would like to salute Veronica Soto, who's the Director of Neighborhood and Housing Services. She's doing a phenomenal job. Uh, her and Aza Kamal, who are, who are running that public process right now. So, th so that's the first step. Um, second, we need to look closely at, at, at displacement prevention. In the housing policy framework, says we need to spend about a billion dollars over the course of the next 10 years to maintain the status quo in San Antonio. In other words, to keep the affordability, the, the, the impending affordability crisis from getting worse. Uh, and that's through various sources. And the idea is that there's going to be a three to five to one leverage with public, private, and philanthropic funds for a total of four and a half to, to five billion dollars. Of that, approximately 25% is, is earmarked for displacement prevention. And that includes you know, things like the Under One Roof Program, um, Owner Occupied Rehab, but it also includes some more robust recommendations. Um, uh, we believe that the City of San Antonio needs to get more aggressive in identifying the issues and getting in front of them. So uh, NALCAP, National Association of Latino Community Asset Builders, earlier this year finished up a study that was commissioned by the Housing Commission, which was, a, which was a vulnerability analysis, right? And and what it showed was all of these neighborhoods around downtown and, you know, down 
down the river and near west side, near east side, near south side, and some near, you know, near north side that were vulnerable um, through a series of, of, of determinants or, or indicators that they used. So that was um, um, the, the neighborhoods that they determined that were, were sort of most vulnerable matched up to a series of heat maps that were generated by um, the Bayer Appraisal District and Michael Amesquita, the, the chief appraiser, um, looked at you know neighborhoods where where housing was increasing at a value or at a rate significantly higher than the background average of five percent or whatever it is for Bayer County, um, dovetailed exactly with the vulnerability analysis. Furthermore, um, there's a series of, of really detailed maps that a researcher from Trinity University, Lily Kasura, has been working on. Um, that overlay other information, demographic information, you know, in, in, in what, what we found really interesting in all of this was that these, you know, the, the brightest pulsing red areas in these heat maps also happen to correlate with parts of town with lowest education attainment, lowest income, oldest housing stock, um, fewest number of Caucasians, so on and so forth, right? So more of this the smoke and fire. So what we said is the city of San Antonio needs to get active and they need to, we need to identify the funding and we need to put it in place so that they can go look at these, at, at the existing affordability in neighborhoods, both multifamily and single family, look at public private partnerships, look at um, creative ways to acquire these properties before, uh, and if they're substandard, you know, you know, raise them and, and build new high quality um, but affordable market rate housing. So this is, I mean, it's gonna take a lot of money and it's gonna take a lot of time, but that's that's the real policy. You know, the discussion about CHIP is, is great, um, but CHIP is a drop in the bucket next to what we need to provide any given affordable housing unit. I mean, it's literally, you know, the gap is just so much greater that it's not almost not worth talking about CHIP as an affordable housing tool other than as one you know sort of tool in the toolbox so that's displacement prevention um the other thing we need to do is we need to build a lot more affordable housing we need to build more affordable housing in all of our regional centers and particularly downtown um and we've talked about how we can do that so there are another series of of things that we've talked about over over the last year or so about protecting legacy homeowners. You know, that was all, all that I was talking about there was primarily about renters. So first we need to develop some tools to allow homeowners in these rapidly value, you know, legacy homeowners in these rapidly evaluating neighborhoods to tap into the equity in their homes. And Ram, I know you're working on some, some pretty creative ideas about, you know, building an accessory dwelling unit as a, you know, another income stream to allow people to pay their property taxes and stay in their homes, creative things like that. Um, as we all know, the Texas legislature is back in session and uh, school finance reform and property tax reform are on the menu and they sound serious about it. Who knows how far it will go, but it's the number one issue in the state of Texas right now. It's not just San Antonio. Um, I know that um, Representative Diego Bernal is intending to introduce legislation. I think he's talking about doing it this session. Um, protecting legacy homeowners. And this is, the gist of it is, if you've lived in your home for X period of time and it's been your homestead for 10 years, um, you know, a, free, a freeze on your property tax, if, if your neighborhood is experiencing valuation at a rate significantly higher than the background average, which many neighborhoods around downtown are. Uh, another tool that's at our disposal right now is a TERS for, for legacy neighborhoods. I mean, we could lay a TERS over any given neighborhood and funnel, what's that? Uh, tax increment reinvestment zone, another word for it is TIF, tax increment financing. Um, and what that means is as, as, as properties increase in value in, in the future over time, you're earmarking that, that money, that increased increment and putting it into a pool um, to allow you to do projects like infrastructure projects downtown, or in this case, it could be new sidewalks for neighborhoods. It could be street improvements. We can do this right now. It's when we change the city charter, which is another thing that we need to do to allow an affordable housing bond, that will then also allow us to use that TERS money 
to actually improve people's homes if, if we determine that that's in the public good. So that's another thing to, to keep our eye on. Um, and finally, my favorite, I was having breakfast with uh, my old friend Mike Casey the other day, and he said, Jim, well, the issue is the appraisal district. You know, why don't we, why don't we get the appraisal district to just, if people can't pay their taxes, just put a lien on their house, but don't collect on that. You know, wait till it's time for that, for that property to, you know, transfer to, a, to an heir or a successor, successor and collect the property tax then. And I thought, you know, what's that? They used to do that. They used to do that. Yeah, they built my grandmother's house in Austin. But how do we institutionalize that so that it benefits these legacy homeowners or senior citizens or, or folks who are on a, on a fixed income? It already benefits the uh, senior citizens. Right. Um, so finally, um, incremental growth. All right, so here's the big one. You know, there is this narrative, and I'm, I don't mean to hog the microphone, but just real quick. There is this narrative out there that the only way we're going to solve the housing affordability crisis is to provide more housing. That's true. Uh, on, a, on a macro scale, that's true, right? If you're looking at the city of San Antonio as a whole, more supply keeps the prices down. And you've got the trickle-down effect of, you know, people trading up. Where that breaks down is at the microeconomic level, right? Where we're looking at particular neighborhoods or, or regional centers or, or what have you. Because there's another mechanic that kicks in, and this is, this is the investment mechanic, right? Where, and, and we're seeing this in some of the neighborhoods around downtown, where, where it's almost a feeding frenzy, an investment feeding frenzy. And it's, and it's a market that's sort of unnaturally hot. Right. I know this because I design a lot of market rate housing and I'm seeing, you know, buyers coming in and buying some of these townhouses that are investors or they're they're running it as an Airbnb while they're waiting for the property to, to evaluate and then they're they're flipping it. Right. So, you know, um, one one of the emerging sort of theories out there about how we how we really deal with affordability is through our comprehensive plan and some of the policies that, that Lori has put in place for slowing down growth, right? Spreading it out a little bit so that neighborhoods have time to adjust to these to these changes, you know, pulling these incentives into the central business district and pulling them out of the neighborhoods was one really good step. Incentivizing our transportation corridors and our regional centers is another good step um, because it, it allows for investment to happen at a rate that, that, that people can manage. Great, great, thank you so much, Jim. Um, I want to. Uh, someone submitted some questions here. Let me let me just go through one or two of them here. Uh, one is, uh, and these are kind of related, but in terms of uh, infrastructure, and you've kind of touched on this in terms of transportation and how that is a component of overall, you know, housing costs. Uh, but what is, you know, we know the streetcar died, um, but in terms of the strategy, connect SA, all that. What is the strategy in terms of leveraging that and other mobility options, transit options, to assist with that overall housing cost, specifically as it relates to downtown? Um, this could be for both of you. Sure, we'll both take a crack at it. So um, there are a lot of initiatives that are underway right now. Um, VIA is a real thought leader um, in, in this space. Um, we've worked with them on um, several projects, one of which was an economic analysis of you know, the Near East Side and the Robert Thompson Transit Center. They've done a similar one for their West Side Transit Center, for Brooks, you know, looking at our transportation corridors, particularly, you know, between downtown and the airport and between downtown and, and medical center and, and UTSA. And they are going out and they are doing real planning, you know, talking about how we leverage through public-private partnerships um, and reduce transportation costs, leverage um, private development doc dollars to build in housing affordability. Um, so that's one of the things that I think is really exciting, and I would really like to see more of VIA's work kind of come to the fore and and be sort of more codified in the, the sort of, of, of thinking of San Antonio government and, and the development community. And I um, want to add to that, we have the 2040 plan that um, Connect SA is working on, and there's, you know, $2.8 billion in need um, over the next 20 years. Uh, but the more we can 
connect people to jobs where they live, um, the better we can reduce, you know, their overall costs and they can afford housing. Um, and so, so how do we connect it? And it's very simple. It sounds so simple. Um, so the level three um, area that we identified in the C-chip was about around those corridors, those transportation corridors. Where are those major corridors that VIA is planning for, for more transit? So we can support housing along those corridors so someone doesn't need a car and they can walk to work. And so it's, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, it's going to be over the next 20 years. And, you know, like Jim, I wish we could control the growth. Um, but we're going to have a million people here, another million by 2040, and we need to be ready. And so right now we do have the leadership in place. Um, we have the Connect SA being led by um, Hope Andrade, um, Henry Cisneros, and Jane Macon. And um, we hope to do more planning. We are working closely with VIA um, as we plan these transportation corridors, um, not just in downtown, but as we connect them to the medical center and these other regional centers. Uh, one more question for you, Lori, and then we're going to take some audience questions. Um, but in terms of the overall outlook uh, for housing downtown, uh, how do opportunity zones play into that? You know, there's this, you know, and I'll let you describe kind of what that is. Um, and opportunity zones, and then also the, the impending uh, UTSA expansion. You know, what does that mean for downtown housing? So the Opportunity Zones, or the new program that came out of this current administration, and it defers your taxes on capital gains, provided that you invest in these Opportunity Zones. So the city, I believe, has, I want to say 28 zones um, that have been designated. Um, one of them is the downtown area, one of them is in the, the near west side. And provided that you invest in that area, you can um, defer your taxes on the capital gains. Now, there's still more rules coming out. Um, we are working closely with all of our partners. We haven't seen any Opportunity Zone project come out yet, um, but it's through 2026, I believe, and so we'll be working, paying very closely, to close attention to this. Now, what was your last question that you had? UTSA. So UTSA, um, that will be a, another game changer for downtown. I mean, any time that you can have backpacks in your downtown, you're sending a signal to this place is, safe to live, it's vibrant because, you know, somebody who's willing to let their child live downtown. Um, so it's, it's a big thing to be able to have children and students in your downtown area. Now UTSA is going to be growing. They currently have, I believe, about 3,500 students in their downtown. Over the next 10 years, they're going to be 15,000 students to downtown. Um, the city of San Antonio just did an agreement with UTSA where we provided them at a fair market value two parcels of property um, on the west side, I'm um, sorry, the south side of City Hall on Dolorosa and Santa Rosa. The county is providing them their property and they're going to build their school of data science, relocate their college of business, and then build a national security collaboration center. That is the first um, growth that will happen, um, the first phase of UTSA ex expansion. They have a phase two that's going to be going on the near west side, on the other side of the interstate. Um, and that will include housing and more student services. That is probably another three to five years away. However, because it's so close to the, those neighborhoods, we have asked them to do the, the neighborhood placement displacement study, look to see how this could impact um, those neighborhoods. And so before UTSA comes back to the city of San Antonio, we have made that a requirement of the request for funding is please don't expect any funding without us seeing that study and how we're going to mitigate any displacement in that area. Um, but this is going to be huge for San Antonio. UTSA with 15,000 students and faculty and staff, that'll bring more jobs, more retail, and more housing to downtown. and just sends another great sign that we're a prosperous city. So we're going to take uh, about two or three questions before we uh, break here. Uh, see one here, we'll go with them. Yeah, we have one mic, or you can be really loud, so it's up to you. <laughs> I'm going to uh, start the question with a little quick antidote. Um, so those hot areas you're talking about that are like extreme poverty with old cars, so I grew up in that area. Um, I went to San Antonio College, graduated, graduated there on a scholarship, transferred to Parsons, the new school in, in New York City on a scholarship, graduated from there, and then 
brought that kind of lifestyle that I had to use to survive in where I came from to New York City. But what I found was that living there, the lifeblood of the city to keep it from going into greater poverty was the train system. It's like vital, right? So all I keep looking at when I think about San Antonio, which I've always looked at in my whole life, of how, does, how can it grow, how can it be better, how can we get a better reliable transportation system so that the people locked in their poverty areas can get around. And it always comes back to that train thing. I don't know if it's naive to think this, but I feel like if you have a train um, and you put the 2.8 billion or whatever is needed for that, it might be more, again, um, towards that first in addressing the, um, the uh, protections for the low-income families, maybe that, that, will, that will get to solve two problems. It will get all the disposable income within the city into downtown, plus what you're doing, already building now. And then it will also protect and empower the poverty because it will give people options to go around the city to get more money and to get it around quicker, to get back home. Um, and then it's more reliable. If it's, you know, like in New York City, again, you may, maybe wait like 13 minutes to get on the train, go somewhere, um, anywhere in, in across all the boroughs. So um, I feel like that's, that's, like, that's where the investment should be on top of the incentive programs that exist. And it sounds like a great plan already, the protections that are there um, with the revised seed chip plan. But I think the train is like number one in solving both issues and increasing the income so that in the long term, it's a long term thing, I know, but I feel like that's the better long term plan than, than just trying to get 2.8 billion to address a, a little area, you know, because this solves two problems, the train. So is it an impossibility? Is, what are the, what are the um, obstacles in getting that? Because I feel like if you have the entire highway system lined with a train above ground, not underground, because we can't do it off for, um, then that'll supplement existing via uh, transportation and, and improvements. So is that realistic or just a naive thing? So, um, you know, we keep, we keep grappling with this issue of light rail in San Antonio. Um, currently, it's not on the table, to my knowledge. Um, perhaps somewhere down the road, I think we're looking at trackless trains, which are just really nice buses um, on kind of fixed route with, with greater service. I encourage you to, to take a moment and go look at the VIA 2040 plan, um, their long-range plan. It's a very well-thought-out document. Um, while it doesn't contain light rail, it, it very specifically lays out, you know, kind of how we're going to increase mobility options, particularly to the historically underserved neighborhoods around downtown and, and hopefully um, bring some of the investment and solve some of the problems that, 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 that you just articulated. Thank you. Uh, questions? Come on. I just have a real quick question about VIA. Why has it not been addressed as VIA to run in the core in the business district, the buses, 24 hours? We talk about things like the restaurants that start 5 in the morning, the hotels that go overnight, the clubs and bars that end at 2 a.m. When these places close, those employees don't get out until 3.30, 4 in the morning. And I don't understand why it, they stop at 12, especially in the surrounding areas now that Whatever is happening is happening. I don't want to use the G word, but there's those individuals cannot get in and out of downtown anymore to go to work. So we talk about uh, you know affordable housing in the downtown area, but what about the people that do not care to work? Excuse me, live in the downtown area, just want to go to work. I don't know if we have anyone from Via I'd like to, like to take a bullet, but uh, <laughs> all right. You know, I, I don't have an answer to that. I really wish I did. Although, it sure wouldn't it be nice if we also had free bus service? <laughs> Strong. Yeah, I mean, but they already have the bus lines. You would think just expanding I think ultimately it's a resource problem, uh, which is, you know, more often than not, that tends to be the answer to a lot of why don't we have X. Uh, anything on this side? Work this side, this side. Right here. So I moved from Austin a couple of years ago, and uh, one of the things I didn't like about Austin is that they uh, really haven't preserved a lot of their historical buildings in the living space. Uh, what is being done here, and that's one of the things that I like about San Antonio is there's so much uh, historical architecture here, uh, and the mixing of uh, modern with a historical. What is being done uh, 
uh, what's in place for keeping that? So we have a series of historic districts uh, around downtown San Antonio. Not everything is under the jurisdiction of our Historic Design Review Commission, um, but downtown is, the downtown design guidelines. Um, we are, and those are fairly, fairly robust guidelines, and it's, and it's a public review process. For the neighborhoods that aren't currently um, protected, I guess is, is the word uh, you, would, you would use, we're having a community conversation right now, and it's a partnership between uh, the Tier 1 Neighborhood Coalition, which is you know, sort of the 50 neighborhoods around downtown, the San Antonio Conservation Society, the Office of Historic Preservation, and the San Antonio chapter of VAIA to talk about what we need to do to preserve um, the, the physical form of neighborhoods. You know, what, 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 you know, what makes good infill, talking about the difference between density versus intensity. In other words, number of people versus how much stuff is getting built on a site. And I think the idea is that ultimately, after we have this long, robust community conversation, we'll come to a consensus of sorts. And hopefully we can eventually bake this into our development code. Initially, it's going to be a set of guidelines that will be applied downtown and through the historic districts um, as, a, as a way to sort of kick the tires on the system and see how we like it, see what's working, what's not working, uh, but before we um, deploy it more widely. And I think the other, the other thing we're looking at right now is the Office of Historic Preservation has just hired a consultant to do a study of housing preservation, and not historic preservation, but preservation of affordable housing stock as, 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 a, as an economic engine. And I'm really looking forward to, to seeing the results of that. And I want to add that you know, we are a historic city. We have such wonderful historic buildings. And as we experience this fast-paced change that we are going to be having over the next 10, 20 years, I mean, our challenge is going to be, how do we continue to maintain that historic building stock? How do we continue to maintain that small town feel that people love about San Antonio? And how do we continue to be true to our cultural integrity? And so those are the challenges that we're gonna have as we go through this change. And um, as Jim mentioned, we have some wonderful codes in place that help us with that historic component, but it needs to bleed into that, that cultural component as well. And that's going to be our challenge that we're going to be facing over the next 10, 15 years. Because you ask people, why do you love San Antonio? And I love San Antonio because it's, it's real, it's authentic. There, there's culture here, but how do we continue to keep that so you have more people who come here because of the same reasons? So I'm going to ask our speakers to make some closing remarks here. Uh, first, I want to make my own, um, which is, you know, I've, I've always been an avid supporter of downtown. You know, for me, the having a successful downtown means that, this is very selfish, but that means my kids won't have to leave San Antonio when they get older to find good jobs. You know, the, the, the talent and the jobs can be here because they're attracted by a strong downtown. And so this is why the issue of housing in a strong downtown is so important for our success as a city as a whole. So for me, you know, making sure that when we are thinking about um, housing, not only what does what does growth and progress have to do, you know, its impact on neighborhoods and displacement and the G word, um, and how do you make sure that you're mitigating that, but also let's not stop the progress. Let's not stop uh, the growth that's happening because our city needs it as an economic engine going forward. Um, Jim, I'll leave it to you for some closing remarks then, more. Sure. Um, so, I, I grew up in downtown San Antonio uh, back in the early 70s. Um, you know, my dad and mom restored an old Victorian on Madison Street. My dad hand-turned the spindles himself with a lathe, and I kind of got in the way. Um, the neighborhood was a lot different back then, right? And this was downtown. We ran around downtown. A lot of the old houses were chopped up into apartments after World War II, um, and when we moved into the neighborhood, it was incredibly socioeconomically diverse. I went to Bonham Elementary School, um, you know, alongside all the kids from Victoria Courts, and the school was, I mean, it was so brown, I mean, you would have 
have thought my name was Orale Huero, you know. So the, the neighborhood, the neighborhoods changed. You know, I got this really rich experience, like a sort of puro San Antonio. Um, I brought my children back to, back to the neighborhood and sent them to Bonham, but it was different, and it's, it's, it's changed. Um, we're experiencing that change in neighborhoods all around downtown, and, and all I can say is we're going to be a great city, you know, kind of whatever that means to, to each one of you, and, and we're, well, we're well on our way. But as we go on that journey together, let's make sure we understand our roots and what matters to us, and let's make sure that we remain a good city as we do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to end on what I said earlier. We are experiencing so much change. And then we have transportation needs. We need to diversify our transportation system. We need to tackle this affordable housing issue that we're facing over the next couple years. And we need to address income inequality in this community. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is through having conversations like these. We want you all to participate as we go through these regional center planning efforts. Help us plan for the city because if we're not prepared, you know, that we're gonna, the growth is going to, um, we're gonna be overcome by that growth. And we need to work together and we need to stay true to San Antonio. I'm gonna go back to we're authentic. We have the culture and we have the historic stock and people love San Antonio because we're that small city that small village and that big town, we can't lose that. And so only by working together and doing these regional center plans together and creating good policy, which is on the city and the county, can we do that. And I'm so thrilled to see so many people here. Um, usually when we go to public meetings, it's 10 to 15. So um, thank you so much. Thank you, Romero, for inviting Jim and I. Thank you, thank both of you for being here and sharing your thoughts this evening. I want to thank uh, Freetail Brewery, uh, our other sponsor, Urban Lazarus. Uh, and then also, uh, my Urban SA will be holding these core talks periodically. The next one will likely be in March. And we want to know what are the topics we want to hear and discuss about downtown specifically. Go to our website and email us and uh, contact us at myurbanessay.com. Thank you. 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 Thank you.